What does open data and transparency mean in my context? Uh, just to give you a quick one-liner on what my context is, J I work for JPAL and JPAL, a network of research affiliates that runs randomized evaluations um, uh, to sort of generate evidence that in turn informs policy. Um, so JPAL South Asia, for example, right now has about 45 to 50 active uh, randomized evaluations in the field, all of them doing primary, uh, most of them doing primary data collection. Um, uh, uh, and I think the numbers are much higher if you count all the randomized evaluations run across by various research organizations that do similar work. Um, so what does transparency mean and why is it important in, in our context? Instead of answering that from a JPAL context, I'm going to be a little bold and try and answer that from a research perspective in general. Just to step back, uh, there's this wonderful uh, 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 presentation that uh, uh, Ted Miguel from University of Berkeley makes when he talks about transparency, where he brings back uh, Robert Merton, who was a sociologist. He had this article in 1942 where he talks about um, the values, essentially, that governed uh, modern science at that point. So he laid down these, uh, what became the Mertonian norms, these four norms uh, of universality, uh, communality, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. Uh, now of this, uh, I think particularly of interest to us is communality and organized skepticism in science, which was uh, governing uh, quite thoroughly apparently at that time. Uh, communality essentially being that there is no sort of private singular ownership on scientific knowledge. Uh, and organized skepticism being that scientific discovery should be subject and is subject to a lot of uh, critical scrutiny. Now, the question that arises is, are we still today adhering to these norms? Um, and the answer to this question is not always very encouraging, right? For example, in, uh, in I think it was 2016, Nature published uh, results from this survey that it ran where they spoke to about, uh, I think around 1,600 scientists and, uh, and asked them about uh, you know, a potential reproducibility crisis in science, and the numbers were a little alarming. About 70% of the scientists surveyed in that, uh, in that survey said that they're not able to reproduce research from other, like one other uh, or any other specific scientist, and more than 50% of them said that uh, uh, you know, they couldn't sort of reproduce their own results at times. Now, this is, this is alarming, and this sort of brings the, the this is kind of the answer to the question why it's important. So the essential challenges that you spoke about in the morning are things like publication bias. Like, okay, are we publishing only things that are good? Are we not talking about things that were unclear or did not see the results we expected? Uh, things like data drudging or data mining or p-hacking. Um, and I'm not going to talk about p-hacking in detail, but if anyone's really interested, and if you know John Oliver, he had this wonderful talk uh, on his uh, the last week tonight in 2016 on p-hacking. You should definitely watch that. Uh, p-hacking and then um, exposed replicability and reproducibility. Like, are we able to reproduce the results uh, that have been published? So these are essentially the problems that bog down research in general and are the problems that j is also trying to address in the work that it does. And then working on practices like 3i is doing too on you know, pre-registrations, data publications, and given that we work so much in, uh, you know, on collecting primary data, a lot of the practices around ethics and norms of collecting data in the field and how do we sort of work throughout the life cycle of a research project to make this data, with, like, you know, work with the objective of making this data public uh, for, you know, future applications. So I think that's essentially the context and that's where it's important.